Yes, so top of the Sports Mag Zone for this Friday. Top American racehorse commentator Pete Ayello is in Jamaica for Saturday's big Jamaica Cup horse race. Ayello has cold races at River Downs, Hialeah, and Oakland Park and has been the chief commentator at Florida's Gulfstream Park since 2016. Ayello's voice has also taken him to Finger Lakes in New York, Canada, and Tampa Bay Downs. Supreme Ventures Racing and Entertainment Limited, SVREL, operators of Jamaica's Caymanus Park, say they are very excited to have Pete on team as an announcer during one of uh, the track's most exciting race days. And we are also excited to have Pete join us live in the studio. Well, Pete, I can tell you that most Thursdays, our viewers hear your voice doing um, commentary with uh, Gulfstream Park races, mostly because of Safi Joseph Jr.'s uh, successes at, at Gulfstream Park. So we're thrilled to have you here. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure to speak with you guys. Yeah, first time in Jamaica. First time outside the continental North America. For real. Canada, uh, Mexico, and the U.S. Yes, never outside the continent. So. so hope you've been enjoying yourself because uh, I hear that you've been here since midweek. Yeah, I got here on Wednesday uh, and I've been enjoying every bit of it. There's so much culture and so much uh, to take in that yeah. uh, I feel like I wish I could stay a few extra days. But mm, yeah. You never um, know. How, is exciting, how exciting has Gulfstream been for you? Because it's the latest stop in a lot of stops for you on the North American continent. Yeah, well, you know what's really special about it, Lance, is that I was born and raised an hour from there. Yeah. So... Literally, as you said in your intro, I traversed the globe looking for a gig to call home, and I ended up at home, yeah. which I would have never, ever thought was possible. Yeah. So that was really, you know, that was really cool. I saw a report that suggested that when you were three years old, you were done with some jockey silks. That was so at clear, Hialeah. Clearly, clearly you, you had a, a racing family. Nah, I mean, only from a fan's perspective. I mean, my perspective has always been from the fan's perspective that, you know, my grandfather was in the Greyhound racing business for 35 years, yes. first as a gambler and then as a uh, operator, a kennel operator. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we, we, had, we had the paramutual world surrounded as far as that goes, but uh, I gravitated more towards the horses than, than anybody else in the family. So just had to figure out how to, weigh, how to make a career out of it, and I got real lucky. And yes. Can you talk to us quickly about the Arizona University racing program that you were a part of? Because in these parts, um, people don't attach horse racing studies to universities. Well, and that, that, it's a very unique program that way, and it's one of those things that for somebody like me that was just a fan, I had no way of networking. I didn't know a trainer. I didn't know an owner. I didn't know anybody that was involved in the industry. So they were really a huge, huge uh, level of importance for me from a networking perspective. Um, you know, they give you the opportunities, and it's up to you what you do with them. But uh, I was fortunate that uh, I took advantage of as many opportunities as yeah. I could. So. so what would you actually learn there? Uh, well, it's more of a specialized business degree. So, um, you know, you're taking the general classes as, much as, as well as all the other undergrads. But mm. you take some business classes through the business college. But then you also take horse racing centric classes. So I took accounting, but then I also took racetrack accounting. Uh, you have a racing office class, you have a regulatory class, no race calling class, but yes, uh, yeah. you know pretty much everything else to build your skill yeah, set. We are at pain sometimes here in Jamaica, Pete, to explain to sports fans that racing isn't a normal sport. And uh, the explanation that you've just given us with the university studies um, for horse racing practically tells you that horse racing isn't a normal sport. It isn't your regular sport. No, it's really not, and I think that one of the things that sets it apart in you know, all sport, we have, we have emotions, but I think in, in horse racing, there's just so many storylines that you know, you know as a fan, and Mariah, I'm sure you know just as a journalist, that, that storylines are what people are really interested in, whether it's sports or mainstream or news or whatever, and there's never any shortage of storylines in horse racing. So, and, and, you know, the thing is, is that half of you know, the old racetrack adage only believe half of what you, or half of what you uh, hear yeah. and nothing of what you see at a racetrack. I think I got that back. Yeah. <laughs> Live television, anyway. Yeah, I love it. Well, Pete, you know, you're getting ready to make your debut in Jamaica for the Jamaica Cup. How excited are you? And tell me a bit about how the entire thing unfolded. Well, uh, I'm very excited, first and foremost. I'm very excited. I got to go to the to commentary box today uh, to kind of scope out the situation. I'm a little too tall for the room. Oh, my. So I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to either sit down or bend down to get, to get the, the full view. But everything else is great as far as the setup goes. You, re you can really see really well, which is important. Um, as far as how did it all come about, um, two or three years ago, uh, I, Supreme Ventures had a broker, uh, broker to deal with some U.S. content providers to allow U.S. racing fans to watch and bet on Jamaican racing. 
and I've always gravitated towards the, the road less traveled. So as soon as I saw that, I was all about at least trying it out. Yes. Uh, and I fell in love with it very, very quickly because, you know, but being, being an island nation and being an insular racing circuit, you can really focus on those storylines and you can build rivalries and you can really, uh, you know, as a fan, you can really get dialed into everything. You know, I mean, the great storyline going into the Jamaica Cup, Runaway Algo against Atomica. I mean, that's a, that's a storyline that, that anybody in the racing world would love to have. Yeah. Well, what's for sure is fans usually become very attached to their commentators and announcers because you are the person that, of course, brings the race to life for them. So your time at Kimana's Park so far, how has your reception been? Well, it's been, it's been really nice, and it's a very, very good, important point that you raise, and I'm so appreciative of it. And in the end, as much as the fact that I'm a horse racing announcer, I like to tell people that I'm really in the emotion business. Yeah. Because if I'm not connect, I'm sure you guys feel the same way. If you're not connecting with your viewers or your audience, then you're probably not doing something right. But if you are connecting with your viewers and your audience, it's on an emotional level, either because they're part of your, your everyday life or you're part of their everyday life and you're telling them something that makes them feel good. So yeah. it's really an emotional type situation and it's been, it's been really cool to see. Yeah, one more before I give you back to Lance because you know he's the horse racing man and I can't take that away from him. What has been your most memorable moment covering the sport so far? Do you remember? I do. It was the very first Pegasus World Cup. It was January of 2017 because you know I had a lot of pressure that day because I had at that point I had only called one grade one race. So Lance knows, but you maybe don't. The grade one races are the upper echelon races yes. in the North America. Mm -hmm. I'd called one up until that point, and it was the worst call of my life. I don't ever want it to be played ever again. Mm -hmm. So going into that, I mean, think about that from a sporting perspective, that the only time you were in that championship match, you choked. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give you a whole lot of confidence going in. Couple that with the fact that I was taking over for arguably one of the best in the industry in Larry Comas. And I really needed to prove myself. Correct. So there was just so much. It's the world's richest race. It's the first, uh, it's the first kind, a race of its kind. There's a, a huge uh, storyline between Arrogate and California Chrome. Yeah. California Chrome had won uh, the, the Kentucky Derby the year before, but Arrogate beat him in the Breeders' Cup. I mean, it's just anything that could involve pressure, it was pressure. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I didn't mess up. That was my only goal in mm -hmm. all of the big races. That's always your only goal. Don't mess up. Yeah. I didn't. And as soon as I shut off the mic, I cried very, very hard. So it was a hugely <laughs> emotional moment. It was like, I because you, you, go from, you go from the first race I ever called, which was in Arizona, a $1,000 maiden race going half a mile that nobody heard other than the people that were there to having a worldwide audience and some of the best horses on the planet. I mean, that's a huge leap. Yeah, I get, I get in the picture because apart from the grade one aspect of the, of the occasion for you, this was your home trap, Florida yeah. and Gulfstream Park. But now the whole world is tuned into Gulfstream Park. So yeah. your home base now becomes a global space for you yeah. and, and your job. Yeah, and then, you know the thing about it was is that you know there was just so much going into that, and I needed to. I think as much as anything, to be honest with you, I needed to prove to myself that I belonged. Yeah. I mean, because I never, honestly and truly, I never really thought of myself as the upper echelon guy ever, mm -hmm. uh, and I still really don't. But um, the fans say otherwise, which I'm very appreciative of. Yeah. But um, you know. Going into that, it really kind of made me think, you know, wow, you know, because yeah. for me, I, I was content making my whole career in the minor leagues. That was completely fine with me. Yeah. So to get to go to the major leagues and broadcast on a big stage yeah. was really special. Mm -hmm. And then I just got the proverbial cherry on the Sunday last week, getting to go to Santa Anita for the Breeders' Cup yeah. and oh getting my. to call some Breeders' Cup races and then not messing those up either. So <laughs> You're fine. All right. Um, we are glued into Gulfstream Park partially because a lot of Caribbean um, personnel, racing men are doing well there. Safi Joseph, of course, Ron Crichton, one of the top trainers there as well. He's Jamaican. Uh, Safi is Barbadian. We're going to uh, play your commentary on the May 17 Mr. Steel Stakes. Safi Joseph running 1-2 there. We'll take that now and uh, talk to uh, Pete Aiello on uh, the call and Safi's successes there after that. Getting started ahead of him is Max K.O. So Safi Joseph Jr. now going to be 1-2 in about four strides. Driven next at the rail, me and Mr. C. Value proposition is after him, and they're at the top of the stretch. Yeah, so that was, um, he ended up finishing 1-2 there, one, Safi, two, yeah. and uh, with Max K.O. and um, Saratoga Flash. Um, 
Talk to us about Safi's success at Gulfstream Park. He's only 36 years, years old and a trainer, that's young for a, a, a trainer, being as successful as he is. And it almost came overnight because he, he left Barbados sort of just hoping that things would work for him in Florida. And there were people advising him against the move. I'm not sure if you know. I didn't know that part of it, but I know that he started out kind of quiet and, and made a reputation for himself as being a good horseman. But I think the key with Safi's success is the key with a lot of our successes in life. He took advantage of all the opportunities that were given him, uh, given to him, and he capitalized on those opportunities. And when you do that in the position that he's in, success breeds success. So when he got winning with 10 horses, then he had 20 horses. And then when he was winning with 20 horses, he had 30 horses. And then when he went from claiming horses to stakes horses, and he started to win stakes races, well, now he's got more stakes horses. So it's really just been a, a snowball in a positive direction for him. And uh, uh, it's really something to see. Yeah, the last seven or eight seasonal titles, he has won all of them. He hasn't lost a seasonal championship at Gulfstream Park, I think, since 2021, somewhere around there. Um, but he's being challenged this time for this meet heading into the, the championship meet, and it looks pretty tight. Yeah, well, you know, he, he again, he, he had such a juggernaut of an operation. He just overwhelmed people with numbers, and, and I think he's kind of changed his focus a little bit. I think he's going more on the upper echelon uh, side of things. He wants more stakes horses. He wants more quality horses to get on the Triple Crown Trail. So he's sacrificing some of those overnight wins yeah. by going after some of the bigger races. Yeah. And um, Ruan Crichton, another Jamaican trainer, um, representing the Caribbean, doing well at Goldstream Park as well. Your thoughts on Ruan? Uh, he's great. I, I'm a huge Ruan Crichton fan, especially when he, with the new acquisitions. He can yeah. move them up as good as possible. So. Yeah. I understand he's got rough entry down here, a horse that I'm very familiar with, getting ready for the Mute Mile. Yeah. And there's a couple other horses down here already that I've called. American Tap, she runs tomorrow. Yeah. What a great race she's in tomorrow. Unbelievable. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited. St. Elizabeth, this stuff. Uh, uh, what a race. Yeah. Rani Bengala against Desert of Malibu and American Tap. Yeah. I only hope Spuddy lets me get behind the mic for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Spuddy's a great commentator as well. Jamaicans love, love Rickman, but um, really great to have you here, Pete, and we're looking forward to hearing you. I'm not sure if you've already designated which which races you will do but we expect that you, you'll be calling a couple of races i'll be uh, i have the binoculars the binoculars made the trip with me and uh, so I'll, they'll be put to use tomorrow yeah <sighs> anthony thomas three-time jamaica champion jockey now at um goldstream park for the past couple of months and he has won twice already a very smooth rider i, I like his seat in his saddle do you think he'll do well there uh i think he needs to get rolling i think it's a tough it's a tough time he's a friend by the way i speak to him on a very regular basis and i've done tell, every, tell him hi for us yeah i will definitely do that uh he's and i think the key is that when you come anywhere new you have to get rolling you have to establish yourself but I'll tell you a story but real quick uh, before we run out of time. When he started it at Goldstream, he had that reputation as being a champion rider in Jamaica. So the stewards knew that I had follow, I follow racing in Jamaica. So one of the stewards came over and said, what about this kid? Does he belong? Mm -hmm. I said, he belongs. And uh, he rode a couple of 50 to one shots. They were nowhere. Yeah. But the steward came over after the second one and he said, you're right. He belongs. <laughs> Just because, like you say, he is so smooth. And when you watch a race... You know, when you watch any race, whether it's a bottom level race or a top level race, if you know what you're watching, you can tell the good riders from the bad yeah. riders. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not very talented, you get exposed real quick. Yeah. And he fits right in with everybody. Yeah. So I, I really like him. He's a good. He's a good rider. Will you be back for the Mute Mile? I will not. Unfortunately, <laughs> we have uh, two four hundred thousand dollar races at Goldstream. That's opening wow. weekend of our championship That's meet. Right. So. Finals of the Sire Stakes. They move the Sire Stakes a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. so. And Safi Joseph is defending champion trainer he at the, has, at the he championship has, meet. Yeah, and he has a filly that will be heavily favored in that race, R. Harper Rose, for a friend of mine, Rich Averill. Um, he, she has got to go two turns, though, and uh, she might need some help. But yeah. she is a very, very yeah. good filly. I just don't know if yeah. she wants to go long. A quick comment before you go, Pete, on Safi Joseph's troubles at Kentucky Derby Churchill Downs last summer when a couple of his horses died and he was suspended, didn't receive, and they didn't take entries from him. New York did the same. White Abario, because of that, had shifted trainers to Richard Dutrow, won the Breeders' Cup Classic on, on Saturday at Santa Anita. And uh, I just saw White Abario winning, and I said, well, that, that's off his horse, but he's the trainer now. I mean, I think you go from bad PR to bad PR there. I mean, they, the, the industry took steps, maybe unfairly so, to try to mitigate some of the, the high-pressure situations yes. that were in from a public perception standpoint. Yes, yes. 
But the end, ending result was is that the Richard Dutro, whether he's a great horseman or not, I don't know him. His record speaks for itself. But he still has controversy associated with his name. Yeah. So you go from controversial to controversial. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Barry is a good horse, so I won the Florida Derby with your the, call yep. uh, at Gulfstream Park last early last year yep. in the build-up to the Kentucky Derby. Yep. yep, good horse though. He is a very very good horse. I think he. I think to be completely honest with you, I think he took advantage of a week a weakened division. Yes. I don't necessarily think he's the best dirt horse in the world, but he is a very very good horse who got good at the right time. Yeah, All right. Uh, Pete, it really is a pleasure having you here Thank on the you. Sports Mag Zone, and um, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it down to the track tomorrow. But I'll, I'll be watching. I'll, I'll be watching. All right. Well, yeah. we, we gotta get you down there. He, he will make himself down there. He loves it. Just teasing. I, I, I should get there. <laughs> Pete Aiello, top commentator at Gulfstream Park in Florida. Great to have him on the Sports Max Zone. And if you're at Cayman Park tomorrow, you'll be near where he is. I can tell you that. Back with more on the Sports Max Zone after this.